Upper Cumberland Regional Coordinator with the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth. And we are so pleased to offer this virtual training today and really thrilled at the response. With over 900 people expected on the WebEx today, you will be muted so we do not experience any audio interference. Also, this training will be recorded. Jill Stott, our Northeast Regional Coordinator, will be monitoring the chat box. So please type in any questions you may have in the chat box and not the Q&A box. And please direct all questions to the host. Jill will be reading those questions out loud during our Q&A session for those who may be joining us by phone. We will do our best to get as many questions answered as time allows. Certificates of participation and NASW CEU certificates will be emailed out to you next week. Time and attendance will be monitored for CEU certificates as requirements dictate full participation. A special note to all those calling into the training. If you need a participant or a CEU certificate, please email our East Tennessee Regional Administrator, Lindsay Cody, that's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y dot Cody, C-O-D-Y, at tn.gov with your name and phone number used to call in so that we can capture your participation. At this time, I would like to introduce Richard Kennedy, our Executive Director, to share a few words. Richard? Thank you so much, Christy. As Christy said, my name is Richard Kennedy, and I have the great privilege to serve as the Executive Director of the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth. Many of you are familiar with the work that we do at the Commission, but for those of you who are not, the Commission is an independent state agency with the primary mission to advocate for the improvement in the quality of life for Tennessee's children, youth, and families. We do this through a variety of different programs and work. Uh, many of you are members of our regional councils across the state and are very familiar with, with that role. We also are very involved with juvenile justice work, children's mental health, really focus on convening partners across a myriad of topics ranging from home visiting to children's mental health to to young child wellness council to youth transitions advisory council but the common thing that is the thread through all of the commission on children and youth is a priority in, on improving outcomes and increasingly you're going to hear us talk about the commission being a thread that weaves through so many different topics and, and issue areas I'm so thankful for our regional coordinators during this time as they have uh, adapted um, out of necessity um, because of the COVID pandemic, but really are just incredibly pleased that, that they are working together to offer training to folks all across the state instead of having just amazing training opportunities in each of their geographic areas. I'm especially thankful for them or to them for um, organizing this learning opportunity that is just so timely and so needed. Um, I wish that I had some magic words that I could say that could heal all of the hurt and all of the emotions that so many people are, are feeling right now. Unfortunately, I would fail miserably if I even tried to, uh, tried to do that. Um, what I will tell you all is that today the Commission on Children and Youth has released um, a statement on racial justice. And so I will read that to you verbatim. Uh, Tennessee is stronger when all Tennesseans have the opportunity to thrive. All Tennesseans do not have the opportunity to thrive while systemic racial and ethnic disparities still plague our state and our country. The Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth stands in solidarity with children, youth, and families across Tennessee and the country to denounce racism and the resulting violence against children, fathers, mothers, caregivers, sons, and daughters of color. The Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth understands too many doors are closed to many children of color. The data that we track on outcomes for children and families make clear in every policy area in every year Black and brown children and youth face increased barriers to reaching their potential. The Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth fights for honest, anti-racist systemic changes that will allow all Tennesseans to enjoy safe, healthy, and prosperous lives. In many ways, I feel like that there's so much more that we could say and should say, but feel like that that is a... Um, uh, a good good place for us um, at, at this point in time. Um, I am so thankful to Dr. Mona Ivy Soto 
who will be leading today's presentation and sharing um, her information um, with us. Um, Dr. Ivy Soto is a, a Soto is an assistant professor at Belmont University, and uh, I'll take a little bit of liberty and say um, increasingly a dear friend to those of us at the Commission on Children and Youth. She is very much the person that we go to when we're having conversations about how to strengthen the Building Strong Brains training, and we have other conversations around making sure we're saying what we need to say in ways that we need to say it. So personally, from an agency perspective, I want to thank her for that. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us to learn as much as possible about this topic during these times. And again, um, just we'll stop blathering on and just turn things over to you, Mona. So thank you so much. I think Mona might be muted still. There we go. Welcome everyone. I'm so thrilled um, to be here and to just get a chance to share on such crucial information. Um, Lindsay, did, were you going to say a few words before I get started? Uh, yes, I'd like to introduce you if I could. I was supposed to introduce you. I apologize that that got messed up. Uh, I should read the instructions. I'm sorry. Thank you, boss. <laughs> Here we go again. Let's try take two. Dr. Mona Ivy Soto is an associate professor in the education department at Belmont University. She teaches extensively on issues of racial inequality and how teachers can utilize social justice education as a way to combat statistic racism within the classroom and community. As a community scholar, Dr. Avi Soto has a passion for training educators, social workers, and other professionals to understand and utilize trauma-informed practices within an equity framework. She prides herself in being an academic that is deeply committed to urban schools and community-based programs and seeks to learn alongside children, families, and those who advocate for justice for children and families every day. She has presented over 100 conference presentations, keynotes and workshops for diverse audiences across the world. She holds a BA in political science and sociology from New York University, an MESD from Bank Street College in NYC, an MSW from Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College, also in New York City, and a PhD in early education from the University of Oregon. She has worked as an educator and clinician in diverse communities throughout the United States. About a year ago, we were honored to have Dr. Mona Avi Soto do a wonderful presentation here in Knoxville on implicit bias. So now I will turn things over to our guest speaker for today, Dr. Mona Avi Soto. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and thank you everyone for the, from the council for allowing me this time together um, with all of you across the country and across the world. It's a blessing and a thrill for me. I wish I could see all of your faces, but in the meantime, I'm excited to know that you'll join with me in this journey for the next couple of hours of learning together. Um, we are at a precipice of uh, time in our country um, in terms of racial injustice. These events that have unfolded um, in the last couple of weeks are certainly nothing new to the Black community, but the urgency and the fierce sense of now that people are feeling around what to do and, and how to act and what to say is so important. So I'm so happy that you're joining in on this to, to gain not only um, a sense of how to move forward, but also to gain um, the academic language and research around why these issues are so crucial. A lot of times when we find ourselves getting into discussions with people about different issues that might be socially charged, sometimes we come away from them feeling inadequate because we don't have the right words to say or the right vocabulary or research. And so I ask all of you to just join in, in this journey to really um, take note of the things that you're hearing today and, and really within yourself, think about the ways that you can apply them in all of the spheres of influence that you're a part of. So the title for today's talk is Promoting Equity and Social Justice by Addressing Individual and Systemic Biases, Moving from Awareness to Action. So that level of awareness is what we're going to start off with, really building that framework that foundational knowledge and then moving ourselves into the steps forward in, in terms of seeing ourselves as agents of social change.
I don't need to go through my bio too much because Lindsay um, gave an overview, but I just want to say that in addition to being a professor for the past 12 years, my heart and my work is really deeply connected to communities of color. And um, I never separate my teaching at the college level from the work that I'm doing um, alongside families because that is what informs my work. That's how I prepare teachers from that very organic um, community perspective. Um, I've been able to do some really amazing work with moms here in Nashville. I started a, a mother's empowerment group at a school in a low income community, and um, that's been incredible. And also just been very fortunate to do a lot of professional development and consultation across the state of Tennessee um, with Metro Nashville Public Schools, as well as many state and federal agencies. So it's given me an opportunity to get to know so many incredible advocates across the state um, who care so deeply about these issues. And before becoming a professor, I also worked as a social worker and a teacher and a home visitor um, in a lot of different areas throughout the United States. So I bring a lot of that on the ground experience that many of you are, are doing. You're, you're on the front lines, you're engaging with families and communities every day, and I commend you and honor you for the work that you're doing. And I'm hopeful that the conversation today will just help to propel you forward in an even more meaningful way. In our less than two hours that we have today, um, we're going to be exploring our own socialization. How did we get where we are? Um, really kind of un uncovering some of those sort of beginning conversations and then exploring a little bit of the neuroscience of bias, um, getting into our brains and looking at the parts of our brains that are operating when we talk about implicit bias. And then we'll, we'll within that talk about really important terms such as implicit bias, prejudice, racism, color blindness. And finally, the importance of being anti-racist. Within that framework, we will end with tools and practices for countering bias and racism in your own personal and professional lives. Um, this is a very hefty agenda. This is con these are conversations and and academic knowledge that certainly spans more than even a semester long course. So, what we're attempting to do in just a few hours is just to scratch the surface. Um, I encourage you, as you receive the resource list from this talk to look through the articles or videos that I've provided um, and continue this work. Um, it, is, it is imperative to just um, really chip away at this every day. Um, it's not something that we can certainly say that we've ever really arrived at, but something that we wanna continue um, striving towards. So these are a few of my favorite um, scholars, I should say, or, or activists. Um, Angela Davis has been just an amazing activist for, for years. Um, and I believe these quotes um, that she says and that Dorothy Day, a, a very famous social worker who started kind of the whole foundational practice of social work, really helps to frame what I would hope that you would take away from today. So this idea that as we have this this driving desire to make a difference, to be to, to step into these uncomfortable spaces that we would no longer accept the things that you know we might have said before. Oh, we can't change that. We can't really do much about racism, but that we'd rather step into these spaces and figure out how we can interrupt injustice. And within that, really understanding the systemic inequities that exist. Richard mentioned that at the beginning of all the, the doors that are closed for Tennessee's children and children around the country and around the world, the, those, those, the lack of access and opportunity. And a lot of that stems from the system of injustice that exists, that has existed for centuries. Um, and so we really have to look at the ways that we can dismantle the system and rebuild it so that it becomes an equitable um, place for all children and families. And we do that by policy, we also do that by really bring, bringing about a revolution of the heart. So for many of us and many people in our communities, we see perhaps our neighbors who maybe weren't paying much attention to these issues before. And we see this, this sense of, of swelling in their hearts towards, towards thinking uh, about these issues in a more important way. And so I hope that as we move forward, there would be even more people who would be propelled towards empathy and emotional connection, but also to action, not just caring about it inside, but really looking at the ways to um, move forward in that and, and address that in a very active way. So in this time we have together, I expect uh, it's not a bi-directional conversation. Unfortunately, I would love to have more feedback back and forth, but I want you to think of yourselves as being very courageous stepping into this space. 
Um, these are complex conversations, as I said. This is not something that we will fix or address in a few hours and not something certainly that ever really ends in terms of our own learning and professional growth. So we want to embrace that complexity and not try to um, desire simple fixes or quick answers. And with that in mind, it is challenging. Um, these are challenging conversations. So we want to lean into our discomfort, and that's a, a really important thing. Um, to get into a stance of reflection, self-reflection, self-awareness, if things trigger us or push our buttons that we really tune into why that's happening and look to kind of seek a little bit more deeply the knowledge and understanding of why that's happening rather than to kind of um, dismiss that. And I always say when I do these kinds of trainings that we want to expect and accept non-closure. We don't walk away from uh, this conversation, you know, feeling like everything's just wrapped up in a neat bow and it's all good now and we've solved the problems. There's a lot of things that are still heavy um, in our world and in our own communities. And so that lack of closure is sometimes hard for us because as professionals who are advocates, we want we want solutions. But these are hard conversations and they, do, they require a lot of work and a lot of um, continued uh, chipping away. So with that in mind, we will begin. So we're going to start just kind of uncovering um, the roots of implicit bias, some of the important language as we think about how to frame it. Um, but implicit bias really is a, a central aspect of the human condition. Every person has biases, right? Every person has certain mental shortcuts or uh, aspects of their mind that 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 require um, a sense of how we view other people and other people who are different from us. So implicit bias is what we th don't think that we think. So we're often not aware that it's even existing because we don't think that we would have that kind of thought about a particular person or we're not sure where that came from. And so it's important to just ground this conversation in the idea that we're all entering into the space knowing that we carry biases. And we'll unpack why that is. I always like to start with a slide because I think a lot, I've seen a lot of these kind of posts on social media, uh, pictures of different color dogs saying, you know, we're all the same, even though this is the same breed of dog, but different colors. And while I'd like to um, think that those are nice photos, uh, they make us feel good, it's really important that in our journey towards anti-racism, anti-oppression, that we don't stop here, right? That we don't get caught up in this idea that, um, we're all the same, that uh, we have this equality that exists. Because if that was the case, we wouldn't need to address these issues, right? We wouldn't need to talk about the importance of being anti-racist. So while it's true that nobody is born racist, it's really important to recognize that as soon as children are born into the world, they are bombarded by racial messaging. They are a part of this deeper system of racial inequality that exists. And they either benefit from that system or they are marginalized or oppressed by that system. And so even though, you know, a newborn baby doesn't necessarily have the awareness of all of the deep and entrenched social issues that are going on, we know that research tells us that by six months, they're already aware of and prefer the faces of their caregivers who may look like them, all right, or may not, but depending on if they're in a, in a mixed race family, but they're already aware of you know, this is what I look like. This is somebody who, who mirrors me. And by three and four, they're asking hard questions about why is that person's skin color different? Is that, are they dirty? Is that why their skin is brown? Why is their hair texture like that? And so again, we wanna lean into those conversations and engage them and, and, and encourage the curiosity, not shun it, but know that our children are very quick to pick up all this, all this messaging. And not only just the observation of differences, but then they begin to assign, if they're not told otherwise, that difference means deficient, right? So if they see somebody that is different from the dominant race, if, a, if they're viewing a child of color, a child who might speak another language, a child with a disability perhaps, and that's not what they're used to in their you know, typical surroundings, they begin to view that through a deficit lens. And unless we're as educators, as parents, as community members, actively teaching them otherwise, they will begin to adopt those biases very early on. So again, we really wanna make sure that we are not just assuming this sort of innocence in society, or even for adults that we're taking this stance of, oh, if I talk about this issue, I'm gonna make it worse. We know that that's not the case. Research tells us otherwise. We cannot heal what we don't reveal. 
Um, and so it's really important uh, to, to think about the things that we need to surface and not shy away from them. We know that we can't address what we don't confess. So until we talk about these things in an active manner and in a regular ongoing conversation, um, we can't get to a place of, of deeper equity. So before we dive into really exploring implicit bias, I want us to think about all of us, each of us on this call, everybody that you interact with, every person that you know has multiple identities, right? Now, each of us might think more or less about certain parts of our identity. Research tells us that African Americans think most primarily about race because they're forced to by society. But some of us may not think very much about race if we're part of the dominant group. We might think more about our age or our social class um, or our sexual orientation. And so this is to remind us that we all have a multitude of identities um, and different ways that we um, operate in the world and different things that we're aware of. And to think about our colleagues, the families that we work with, what are the identities that they're thinking about most often? What are the things that they're most aware of that they have to be aware of when they go out in public, that they have to think about when they enroll their child at school? Um, and, and being sensitive to those things, creating space for those conversations. This is a lot of words on a chart, but this helps us to see that within this, these categories of identity, there is a privileged category and there is an oppressed category, right? If we are on this call and we're looking through these categories and we realize that we can check off the box as most of our identities being privileged, that's not a space to lead us down a path of guilt. It's not to make us feel bad or, or feel remorseful, but it's to understand that with that level of privilege comes a position of responsibility, comes a, a, a strong um, requirement really to think about how our privilege operates in different spaces, in work, in our community, um, the different, you know, uh, social spheres that we are a part of. How do my privileged identities play out? And what does that mean for people who don't have those privileged identities that I'm interacting with? What are the things that they're thinking about? So what that means is within each of those categories, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, social class, even language, the, that list was not exhaustive. There are other things. But some people within those groups have more access to social power and privilege, right? And that's in that category of privilege. And other groups, right, that we would consider to be targeted or marginalized groups in society have less access to social power and privilege. And I think it's important to note, we're very quick to recognize that there are people who are overprivileged, right? But we're less quick to see that there are people who are underprivileged. And I don't necessarily like those words, but if we can recognize that there are people who have an abundance of um, access and entry points, whether that's due to their wealth, um, their immigration status, if they don't have to worry about citizenship or immigration issues, that's a, a, a door that's open for them. We recognize that there are people who have this, um, um, the, the, this access to things, but yet, if that exists, then we have to be able to see that there are people who lack that access due to structural issues that have created that from centuries, right? From hundreds and hundreds of years. These are not new things. These identity categories are not new. Um, the, the designation of privileged or oppressed, that's not new. Um, so it's important to recognize that these are things that have come as a result of historical and structural things that have been going on for centuries. So as you're thinking about that, um, and I can send out uh, a little activity that you can do that's an identity wheel. If we were in person, I would ask you to do that at your tables. So you can really dig into that a little bit deeper and think about all those parts of your identity and which ones you think more about um, and which ones you're forced to think more about, you know, uh, depending on where you are, when you go out in public, um, you know, what communities you're in. So those are really important things as we begin this conversation of thinking about bias. So we don't have time to, to answer these questions, but as you're thinking about those identity categories, as I asked you before, did you find that most or all of your social groups were considered advantaged or targeted, right? If you were part of the advantage group, meaning you had access, you had privilege, what does that say? Again, not a position of guilt, 
but what's the responsibility that comes with that? If you look down that list and many of your categories were targeted, what does that mean? What are the kinds of things that you're experiencing in terms of um, injustice in society? And what implications does this information have on our work life, our personal life? We'll be uncovering those things as we go through. So let's get into defining implicit bias. What is it, right? We hear this, it's become a buzzword. I don't want it to just be a buzzword for any of us. I want us to really understand um, the conceptual underpinnings of this concept. So it's defined as the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. It's activated within our brain involuntarily without awareness or intentional control. And as we said before, everyone is susceptible. So we form the implicit, these implicit biases by both direct and indirect messaging that we receive about different groups of people. So what does that mean? Direct messaging might be the things that your family or your community or different people have said to you or demonstrated to you in actions about people of different backgrounds. And people tend to focus on that like, oh, nobody's ever told me they don't like African Americans or Mexicans or Muslims. Nobody's ever said that. And so they think, well, that, that means it hasn't impacted me. But what I like to challenge us to think about is not only direct messaging, but indirect messaging. Maybe nobody's ever said, we don't like this group of people, but they've used racially coded language to talk about, oh, the people that live in that part of town or the kids that go to that bad school or um, you know those people in that zip code. And so even without naming perhaps the ethnic group or um, the religious group, as individuals, we have easily picked up on this messaging of associating certain groups or individuals with good and certain groups or individuals with bad or certain people that we trust and certain people that we don't. And so this messaging, be it direct or indirect, has a profound effect on how our brain operates as we begin to view different people. If we think of our brain like an iceberg, I know this iceberg metaphor is used in a lot of different analogies for things. The conscious part of our brain, right? Research tells us only about 2% of our thoughts are conscious, right? That the, the, the majority of our thinking is tapped in and tucked into that unconscious part of our brain. But that conscious part of our brain is that smaller tip of the iceberg, the part that we can see above the waterline in this picture here. Um, this, this unconscious or this conscious part is often what we're thinking, right? And so we only are aware of, of, of just a small amount of that. But our unconscious mind, right, the majority of what we see, all of that that's below the surface, absorbs millions of bits of sensory information uh, per second, right? We can't even comprehend all of the things that are coming into our mind, right? And that's part of how our brain functions because it can't take in all of those things. You know, it has to, to categorize and sort and, and, and create filing systems in a way to help us survive, really. We wouldn't be able to survive if we were conscious of all of the millions of thoughts coming in per second. Research uses an analogy of, if you ever think about when you're really tired and you drive home and you get home and you're like, I don't even remember driving home, right? Your brain went into a place of, because it was used to that drive, it, it really almost operated automatically. It was your automatic brain that was happening, right? Because you weren't even aware enough to be able to maybe remember all the things that you typically do when you're more alert. So even that small example gives us an idea of how our conscious and, un and unconscious brain is operating at the same time. So another scholar who studies unconscious bias, as I said, reminds us that only 2% of our emotional cognition is conscious, right? Um, it, our brain is using these processes to really rapidly assess all of the things that we're seeing all the time. So it's 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 a product of, of, of how our brain works, right? And that's why we say to be human is to be biased. But what happens is it's assessing um, humanity based on these categories of in-group, out-group, good, bad, threat, fear, right? Um, and so we know that within that, the prefrontal cortex part of our brain lights up when we see someone is highly human, but it fails to activate when we dehumanize people, right? And that sounds like you might be sitting there thinking, I don't dehumanize anyone. But again, if we think about that, maybe those subconscious or even um, indirect messaging that we have picked up from the media, from all of these sources of information about particular people groups, 
right? Our brain is literally firing off particular messages if we've associated those people groups with less, less than human or, or not our friends or part of the out group or part of a group of people that we don't have relationship with. Um, and, and as a result of that, the brain is sending messages of fear and of, of distrust, of disconnection. And that's how these implicit biases begin to fuel and really take hold. So we've talked about the amygdala. If you want to do more research on this, certainly looking into the amygdala, such an important part of the brain in terms of understanding implicit bias. Um, it's the, the most primitive part of the brain. It processes emotion, long-term memory, and behavior. So if you think about that, emotions, long-term memory, and behavior, all of those three elements are very important when we think about bias, right? What is our emotional reaction to people who we would consider to be you know, not within our, our typical group or those who are outside of our, um, our preference or different from us in any way, right? Um, that becomes part of our long-term memory and that impacts our behavior, right? So these are all the things that are important to re recognize when we find ourselves in these situations where maybe we're not even aware consciously of our reactions to certain people, but this is what's happening behind the scenes. Again, sort of in that bottom part of that iceberg. It has a direct impact on our thoughts, our behaviors, the decisions we make, the policies we create, the practices we carry out in our workplace, in our home, the way we raise our children, the way we socialize, it has huge implications. So as we said before, the amygdala is especially sensitive to fear. It scans wherever we're going, right? Wherever we find ourselves, it's scanning that environment to look for things that, that are considered to be threatening, right? We talked about how that part of the prefrontal cortex lights up, right, depending on who we see, if we view someone as human or not human, right? And, and so all of this is basically how we have trained our brain to react. That fear response is really important. So that's an, an innate part, right? We know for little kids, we tell them, oh, if you touch the stove, your brain's gonna send a message that that was hot and that's gonna teach you not to do that anymore. So that fear response, it's a necessary survival response. That's the part that is innate and it's part of everybody. But what we do to uh, tell our brain what we're afraid of, the kinds of messaging that gets bombarded into us that tells us who is safe, who do we trust, um, who's like us, who's not like us, that's the part that we have a lot of control over. And that's what we want to really think about. How do we dismantle that bias and create more equitable thoughts, actions, and behaviors? So there's three main processes that are a part of understanding implicit bias. The first one is called priming. Priming is a psychological phenomenon in which a word, image, sound, or any other stimulus is used to elicit an associated response. So there's so many things that we could think about. Um, when you're watching TV, right, advertising or a billboard when you're driving on the highway and you see a particular sign and it makes you think of something, or see a word or an ad and it, it immediately um, di directs you to a product or an experience, right? That's what advertisers and marketers, that they, they depend on this. That's their whole longevity of their work, right? And so that kind of um, priming connection, again, it's not a bad thing. It's it's how we're wired. It's, it's what, what our senses rely on. So that in and of itself is a typical and expected phenomenon. It's something that's common to everyone but it's certainly part of this step-by-step -step process of bias. So after priming, we think then about associations, right? From that, that, the, the, that connection that we've made between certain words and images or certain pictures and, and experiences, right? That's where we begin to develop those associations. Um, what we hold about groups of people that are created and reinforced through priming, right? Um, Associations occur oftentimes without conscious guidance or intention. So I say something like peanut butter, you say jelly. Um, you know, there's lots of these things. We, this example of the word nurse is recognized more quickly following the word doctor than following the word bread. So we could go on and spend hours talking about all the associations that we have. And many of them are just fun and funny and light, but where it becomes more important to really uh, tune into as it pertains to implicit bias are, what are the associations that we have made that dehumanize, that create a fear-based response to people who are different from us, All right? And those are the kinds of things that we really wanna think about. So we've got priming, we've got associations, and then we've really got um, this idea of a 
assumptions, right? That that priming and associations leads to assumptions. This is a really uh, powerful quote. Um, it says, "Implicit bias comes from the culture." I think of them as the thumbprint of our culture on our minds. Human beings have the ability to learn to associate two things together very quickly. Again, that's a process that we said is innate. But what we teach ourselves when we choose to associate is up to us. So that association of items is something that our, our or experiences or whatever it is, is something that our brain naturally does. But what we choose to associate is up to us. And so for many of us through this training and through these times of reflection, we have to disassociate a lot of the things that we have learned, right? Many of us have grown up and we have associated African-American males with crime or delinquency. We have associated Latinos with immigration issues. We have associated um, Asian people, perhaps South Asian women with um, nail salons or cleaning ladies, right? And so all of those associations, while there might be bits and pieces bits and pieces of reality within those. We're not denying the fact that there are some pieces of reality within those associations. They don't tell the whole story, right? And that's where it can become problematic. We say that stereotypes are not necessarily um, uh, incorrect or false, but they're incomplete. They don't give us the full picture of humanity. And when we rely on those stereotypes, especially those that are embedded in negative, uh, deficit racist ideas, we we really are not only wrong in our thinking, but we can cause a lot of bodily harm as we've seen happening uh, to members of society, right? This can become a life or death issue for people, not just, oh, I don't really, you know, like that person or, oh, I, I only associate that person with that thing. It can lead to life or death. So these are very, very serious things. And this is what we've just said. So we've got that priming associations and assumptions, right? The assumptions can have life altering consequences for people of color. So what do we do about that? What we do about that is really, we have to retrain our brain. We have to train our brain to operate away from system one, um, which is uh, this unconscious, fast, effortless thought process, right? The way that we see something and we make an immediate connection. Um, the way that we uh, just have this almost this thought about a particular group of people that is not informed in any reality, but it's based in fear. It's based in 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 just unjust and and wrong ideas. We have to retrain our brain to operate more in this idea of system two, right? That is conscious, deliberate, slow, and effortful. That has to take the time to think about. Wait a minute. I just um, realized that I was in the grocery store and I saw a young black male, and I had a negative association with him because I thought he would be stealing something. Why do I think that way, right? We literally have to talk ourselves through this process. Why do I think that way? Where is that coming from within me? Okay, that's not a right thought. I don't want that thought to happen. I'm going to, 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 to think more closely about lots of positive associations that I have with young black males. I'm gonna think about all the wonderful young black males that I know, and I'm going to humanize this experience, right? If you heard what I said there, though, the only way that we really develop these conscious, deliberate, slow and effortful connections or reconnections in our brain is to have other thoughts and other things to fill our mind with with groups or people that we have had negative associations with. Right. So if we've grown up and all of the media that we've um, taken in, all of the conversations, all of the, the policies and practices that were in the community that we were a part of have told us negative messaging about particular people groups, then we have to work really hard to get to this system too, right? It's not naturally just gonna come to us, right? We can't just say, oh, I'll be a nice person. I'll hug somebody um, of a different race and that'll make it all better. No, we have to really do the work to create these other experiences, right? That, that change our thinking because what we thought about different people groups is flawed. It's incorrect, right? Different people groups don't necessarily have to do anything different, right? We, we don't want to tell our friends of color or, you know, immigrant or refugee families that we work with, well, you have to do something different for me to humanize you. No, no, no. We have to do the work. If we're part of the dominant culture, if we've adopted these beliefs, we have to do the work to figure out why is it that I see that person in less than a human way? And what do I need to do to change that? All right, so that's a really important part as we think about moving towards system two in our brain and, and really rewiring, re 
figuring our brain to think more consciously and slowly and to therefore rid ourselves of some of this implicit bias. So as we think through this, it's really important to, um, cause some of you I imagine are thinking, well, I don't, I don't do this. I've never done anything. I've never said anything awful to a person of another race or ethnicity. Um, or I don't want to be called a racist. Um, that's, that's an offensive term to me. A lot of times that we don't think of these thoughts or actions or beliefs, um, in a way that puts a label on it, but it's important to recognize that if we don't address how these unconscious thoughts um, are swirling in our head, they can very easily lead to behavior, right? We've seen that through all of the things happening in our society, which again, might seem like these big acts and something that we could separate ourselves from, like I would never do that, but it, it doesn't even have to necessarily be something um, as horrific and vile that we've seen um, as of recent. It can be things that go on in our workplace where we, you know, either are silent when something is said that is uh, racially, uh, racially offensive to somebody. It might be that we don't consider a person of color for a particular promotion or uh, even an opportunity because of our negative associations, right? So these things can have major implications, not just on the acts that we see on the media that, that we would say, oh, well, that's, that's extreme, but the day-to-day -day life of our, our work, our family, uh, the, the, the places that we choose to spend time in, people that we choose to spend time with, right? That, that it doesn't have to be anything extremely um, explicit to still have a direct impact on, um, you know, a negative part of who we are. So we really wanna uh, be thinking about, not necessarily that it's this direct hostility, it can be certainly, but that it could also be um, something that is in our minds and in our hearts that um, ends up playing out into certain aspects of our work life, even more subconsciously. So take a minute to look at this slide and I want you each again, I'm sorry, I would love to hear from you, but I want you to think about when unconscious bias creeps up in your life. What are the, and it's not like one or the other within these circles, it could be multiple, but what are the times at work, at home, in the, commu in the community that unconscious bias, that you find yourself more aware of the biases that you're thinking, right? Um, for a lot of people, uh, it can happen um, when there's negative emotions going on, when we feel upset about something that might be happening in the world, right? It can immediately direct us to thinking about groups or people that we have a bias towards, right? Um, sometimes we can almost absolve ourselves from this responsibility of understanding how bias impacts if we think of ourselves as a good person, right? This is not about whether you're a good person or not a good person. We're all susceptible to this. So we don't want to um, excuse ourselves from this by just making the assumption that, oh, if I'm a nice person, that that means that I'm not, you know, capable of this. So think through these, these things and, and consider the times in your own life when unconscious bias has been more apparent to you, right? It, it, it could be there much more often than even these um, examples. But what are the times when it's most apparent to you? Another thing to consider is the notion of prejudice, right? And I'm, I'm specifically um, naming these terms because it's so important. Um, implicit bias and prejudice, I would say, are neighbors. <laughs> they're really close together, right? They're, they're even spheres within the same, uh, you know, design, if you will. Um, but prejudice and racism are not the same thing. And that's something I really want to point out because I hear those two terms being used interchangeably and, and they're not the same thing. So, if we think of prejudice as a preconceived judgment or opinion based on limited information, right? The prejudiced belief or even statement might be a result or likely is a result of our implicit bias, right? It's, it's, it's what we think or believe based on what's happening consciously and unconsciously in our brain from those associations, again, from those, that priming process and the assumptions that we've developed. Prejudice is one of the escapable consequences of living in a society that's been built on inequality, right? Again, as I said, this is nothing new. All of what we're seeing today, what we've seen, you know, over the last year, several years, is, is, a, is a result of historical inequality, historical racism, historical oppression. So all of these things have been passed on generation to generation, um, and, and that's 
that's how that's the reason why many all of us are really susceptible to that. Now, we have this great opportunity to step in, right, and actively change the narrative, actively shift the train, if you will, shift the tide from having such a direct impact on ourselves, on our children, on the next generation, right? So even if these are inescapable consequences of living in the society that we do, we don't wanna just sit back and say, well, that seems to be too big of a problem, I'm just not gonna solve it, right? Think about it this way, Think about um, if you're part of a church community and your church community goes and does mission work. And we're not going to unpack all of that because there's some problematic things that can come with that. But people go to third world countries and even, you know, communities within the United States and they go and feed people that are in need or they provide medical assistance. Right. Very needed uh, supplies and, and services. Right. We don't stand back and say, well, you know what? People are always going to be poor. These third world countries are always going to be poor. So, you know, there's nothing I can do. No, we step into it. We say, I might not be able to solve it forever, but I'm going to make sure that I'm going to provide educational resources. I'm going to provide medical care for this village at this time, right? We step into it. We look at turning the tide. So it's really important that we think about how am I stepping into this? Even if the problem seems so large, so much bigger than just me individually, there are still many ways that I can begin to uh, make an imp in, in, impact and imprint in this larger system of injustice. Beverly Daniel Tatum, um, if you haven't read her book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? It's an older book, but it's an exceptional one. It's a great resource if you're you know, starting on this journey of understanding racial identity and also um, race and racism. She is a developmental psychologist. She also writes really with the perspective of children in mind, which is great. But she talks about the analogy of racism, prejudice being like smog, right? Um, if you're, if you think of communities across the world that have a lot of smog, um, California, in Los Angeles, in in um, other countries across the world, other cities, um, some days that smog is a lot thicker than others, and we see it, right? But other days, it's still there, but we might not see it as thick, right? It's the same, like. This, this is the same analogy when we think about bias, right? It's always there operating in society. Some, some situations might bring it up, might kick it up more where we see it, it's more tangible in front of us, but it doesn't ever really go away. And so that's an important thing to think about. Um, we want to think about how we are addressing that daily um, surrounding of inequality, of injustice, um, and not just seeing it on the times that we're aware, but recognizing that it's always there. skip over that slide. So another way that um, many of us perhaps in the past or even now have participated in um, an act of bias, and this is not to make anyone feel bad, but it's just to help us understand how we can be better and be different, is many of us have perpetuated this myth of colorblindness. And I've seen this come right back up to the surface um, on social media, you know, in, in the days and weeks that have passed in, in, in the wake of all of this horrific tragedy, that there's lots of people who are posting things, you know, saying we're all the human race, we're all the same. And while that might sound like a nice ideal to strive for, it's not the, re the social or, uh, you know, contextual reality that we actually live in, right? Some people think that colorblindness um, is a way to end racial discrimination because Oh, if we're all the same, if we're all equal, then, you know, that's how it is. But it really um, dismisses and disregards the reality of injustice that people of color are experiencing minute by minute, day by day. And so when we see, I don't, when we say, I don't see color, I see people, or there's not, there's no races, only the human race. It's denying or um, distracting from the real issues that we have to handle, right? I use this analogy and I'm not I'm not saying that mental health and racism are the same thing, but if you had a friend who um, came up and told you that they were suffering from anxiety and depression and they told you all of the characteristics that they were feeling, all of the ways that their body was reacting and their mind was um, impacted by this, and you said, I don't think that's a reality. We all have that, right? Or, you know what, that's not really a big deal. Don't put a label on it. Um, that's just That's just a human condition. 
how would you feel? How would your friend feel? All right, we would never wanna do that because we would say that's dismissing this person's pain. That's discounting the reality of what this person's lived experience is. But yet I believe some of us do this every day when it comes to race um, and we, we kind of go through with this colorblind ideology. So what we wanna do instead is refute colorblindness, um, really be color affirming, be uh, affirming of people's differences, be affirming of their unique characteristics, their ethnicity, uh, the languages that they, that they speak, their skin tone, their hair texture, um, you know, look at all of those things as, as a beautiful uh, source of strength for our, our country, our society, and at the same time acknowledge that all of those, um, all of the forces of inequality have created a situation where people of color have been forced to be made inferior, right? Um, and, and by letting that be known, we are refuting colorblindness, right? We're saying, I do see your race. And when I see your race, I also understand racism. I, not personally, I may not understand it personally, but I understand that racism exists. I understand that it's a reality. And I'm not trying to, to, to move away from that or, or dismiss it because it makes me uncomfortable if I'm part of the dominant culture. So as we think about that, as we reflect on, um, you know, colorblindness and how do we move away from colorblindness? I want us to look at this timeline if you haven't seen this yet, right? I hear a lot of people say, well, we've been having these conversations about race for too long and things are so much better now for people of color. Look, we elected a black president or look, you know, we have black athletes and black movie stars and people are making more money and, you know, on and on and on. And while those things, again, those are true. We talked about there are there are nuggets of truth, but that doesn't uncover the whole story, right? We have experienced, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of, of oppression against African Americans, against Native Americans um, in the United States, right? And so we cannot uh, fix or fully solve that problem in, you know, 50 years that have, that have been since maybe new uh, laws or, or legislation have been passed, right? Even with new laws that have been passed, we see voter suppression. We see other um, acts of, of policy levels of discrimination that are still going on that don't protect people of color. All right, research tells us that it would take black families until the year 2241, 2000, 2241, I can't even say it, it seems like so long, to achieve wealth parity, the wealth parity that white families had in 2013. So seven years ago, 2013, whatever was the, the average, you know, wealth index for white families, it would take black families till 2241 to achieve that. Folks, if that doesn't make your heart beat a little bit differently and make you think about inequality, that's not just, oh, people need to work harder. That's a structural inequality that has persisted for centuries that has caused this widening gap. And that's just one example we'll get into in a minute all the other examples of this gap, right? This access gap, this opportunity gap um, that exists. And so really looking at that timeline in terms of the hundreds of years that have gotten us to the place that we are, these are not issues that are gonna be solved overnight. And they're not issues that are gonna be solved by not talking about them, right? We have to do the hard work, the brave work, the soul work of really working through these things. Some of you might remember some of these signs from your own lifetime, right? Or your, your relatives, right? This is not that old. <laughs> um, you know, Ruby Bridges, who, who uh, was the first child to integrate an all-white school, is still alive, right? These are not things that are, 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 are without um, remembering very recently. And again, those are, those are just those sort of first monumental moments. Uh, you know, we have so many examples still, of, even if these signs aren't everywhere as they used to be, there's still a lot of this underlying uh, belief and, and, and practice that we see in many communities. I remember before I moved to Tennessee, driving through a small town in rural upstate New York, and there was a sign, it didn't say we serve whites, but it said uh, English only, no Spanish here, right? It, it was so upsetting to me. I thought, wow, isn't that, isn't that so sad that, that would, the sign was plastered all over this town? right? That they're denying the, the beauty and the value of another language, right? Even though we want kids to learn it in school so they can be business savvy, we don't want people, we don't want native speakers to speak Spanish. 
was very upsetting to me. So some of these signs have just taken, they just morphed into a different, uh, a different tone. We've seen through the COVID pandemic, a, a, an increased uptick of anti-Asian sentiment, right? Of people perpetrating acts of violence against Asian people, right? Of saying horrific things ag against their ethnicity, their language, their culture. So these are not, these are not things that are in, in a distant memory in any way. So we've gone through implicit bias. We talked about prejudice and colorblindness. Now I wanna move to the big R, racism, right? This is the point at which I think some people struggle to fully understand and embrace this, but, I, but, but stay with me if you will, um, because understanding racism as its own entity, building, up, building off of implicit bias, um, and, and, and colorblindness, but as its own entity is really important, right? Because even though all people can be biased, right? That can go between any and all ethnic group, not all people can be racist, right? Because racism is prejudice plus power. Prejudice plus power. So we said all people can be prejudiced, right? You could be a person of color and you could hold prejudices towards another person of color or towards a white person. You could be, um, a uh, person who's a part of the LGBT community, and you could, um, even though you are a, a targeted marginalized identity, you could hold prejudices towards another group, right? So any person can hold prejudices, but only people who are part of the dominant culture can be racist, right? Only people who have access to and hold institutional and structural power can be racist, right? Now, notice I said the words institutional and structural and not necessarily individual power. Because a lot of people say to me, well, I don't have a lot of individual power. I'm white and I grew up poor. And I say, okay, you, you part of your identity as being poor is certainly, certainly did make life difficult for you in that way. But your white identity gave you many, many advantages that you probably didn't even see, right? Many doors that were open for you that weren't open for other people, right? So if you compare your experience as a white poor person to a person of color who's poor, there was many, many doors that were closed, many, many opportunities that were not provided, many, many um, acts of discrimination that, again, as a group, people of color who are poor experience because of their race and their socioeconomic class, that if you're poor and white, you might've experienced some of that because of your socioeconomic class, but not because of your racial background. So there's all of these systems that have been set up that even inadvertently benefit and advantage white people, right? So even if you say, I personally have not been a recipient of this benefit, if you begin to really look back at your life, you might think differently, right? All of the doors that were opened for you that may have not been open for somebody else. And again, as you look through some of the videos that I'll send, um, that will it will highlight some of these things in really powerful images and 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 wording that I think will will hit home. Um, so racism is, is like other forms of oppression. Um, it's not only person, a personal ideology, but it's also, again, that system. All of the structures, all of the institutions like education, housing, criminal justice, um, employment, healthcare, all of these institutions that are really the pillars of our world, of our society, that have been set up to advantage white people and, and therefore to the disadvantage or the oppression of people of color. Again, when we talk about this, we're not only just talking about individual circumstances, right? Because some people said to me, well, I, I'm a white person. I went to the doctor. I was treated unfairly. That very well might be true. I'm not denying that there aren't individual situations where people can have a, a negative experience with the education system, the healthcare system, et cetera. But if we look statistically speaking, people of color, and, and Richard alluded to this, people of color fare worse in every category uh, of every data point structurally um, within all of those systems. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, is that just because of personal failure? Absolutely not, right? That's because of structural inequality that exists. It doesn't mean that there aren't some people who have made poor choices, right? If you have um, not taken care of your health and, and you have a bad out health outcome, I'm not saying that that's just because of racism if you're a black person or a brown person, but if you are somebody who hasn't taken care of your health and you then go to the doctor and are denied access to different things because of your race, then that's what we're talking about, right? So there's still a personal responsibility to eat better, to exercise, to do things to take care of yourself. But even when those things remain constant, 
people of color still fare worse, right? Women of color, for example, even when we look control for social class, still have a much higher outcome of uh, of um, uh, uh, babies who die after birth, right? Of, of of infant mortality, right? And we're not just talking about poor women. Um, there's a wonderful TED talk called "Is Racism Making Us Sick?" and that really gets into a lot of the data that really looks at that inequality. So we have to ask ourselves if it's beyond just personal choices, then it's got to be something bit bigger. It's got to be these structures, these systems, these institutions. So I'm going to just take a moment to give us a brief history lesson and then weave the thread through how some of this history has created and led to current policies. So if we had time, I would take you through all of those systems and talk about the historical inequality of how those systems were built. And I'd encourage you to do that work on your own, depending especially on what industry you're in. So if you're coming from the healthcare industry, if you're coming from you know, the education world or the mental health world, do the research on how racial inequality has been historically woven through each of those industries and, and, and institutions. But for example, I want us to just take a moment and look at housing because housing is definitely a pillar of a community. It impacts a lot of other institutions like education, um, et cetera, even access to healthcare, depending on where you live. It's what a lot of people that I talk to point back to and say, well, that's because they live in that neighborhood. And I say, well, you don't really understand why they live in that neighborhood. Let's take it back a little bit. So let's look at um, a little bit of this history from slavery and Jim Crow's law, Jim Crow laws that didn't really uh, end in any way until 1964, not that long ago, African Americans were historically prevented from building wealth, right? Prevented, like policies were in place that, that prevented them from building any type of wealth, right? Um, for example, in the 30s, as part of the New Deal, the, the Federal Housing Administration, we even know that now is FHA loans, some of you may have FHA loans, um, they were, that was created to make home ownership accessible to more Americans, right? We know that if you own a home, you own a piece of success. It's something that you could pass on generationally. It's an asset, right? The government created color-coded maps at this time, green for good neighborhoods, red for bad neighborhoods to determine who got those lo loans. And that became, that process became known as redlining, right? Basically systematically preventing black people from getting home loans and home ownership literally excluding them from neighborhoods. So when we look at neighborhoods around our cities, the towns that we live in and say, why do black people live on that side of town? Well, it's not just because they want to, right? It's because that those were likely areas that were designated as the bad areas and the only areas that they were able to have access to, right? All of these conditions that we see now have, have historical um, roots. But at the same time that redlining was going on, Right, the Federal Housing Administration was subsidizing mass production of these subdivisions of housing, which became the birth of the suburbs. Right, so there became this 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 movement that we call white flight of moving away from those red areas towards uh, these new communities that were being built, where there was no homes that were able being able to be sold to African Americans. Right, that segregation just became embedded in the the very framework of how these communities were built. Right, so white families were given all these subsidies and, and opportunities to move out of urban areas and, and, and African Americans were forced to stay in subpar communities where there was a lack of resources, a lack of access, even if they could afford to buy homes in these communities, they were they were literally labeled and prevented from doing so. These policies resulted in 98% of home loans going to white families from 1934 to 1962. Again, this is incredible to think about. Right, this is the generation of, of, of some of you or your parents, right? And so when we think about the realities of how that plays out now, if you were not able to gain access to housing during that time, it's gonna take a long time to catch up. And we know that even now there's not um, adequate resources. There's not even um, uh, opportunities for, for people of color to, to gain access into um, you know, those other communities. So. We just see not only with home ownership that you you know you gain access to a community, but that 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 generational wealth, right? When we looked at that last slide about when black black Americans could achieve wealth parity, part of that is from home home ownership, right? All being able to accumulate that wealth and pass that on to future generations. 
here are some that that's a, just a, a brief look at history and there's a wonderful book by Richard Rothstein called The Color of Law. I'd encourage you to read it if you're interested in this. Um, it, it, it gives a lot of history in this. Um, but here are just some other statistics that are more or are more current now. Uh, for every hundred dollars in white family wealth, black families hold just five dollars. Again, that's looking at large uh, statistics. Um, the Institute for Policy Studies had a recent report that showed that between 1983 and 2013, the wealth of the median black household declined 75 percent, the median Latino household declined 50 percent, and at the same time, the wealth for the median white household increased 14 percent. So, folks, this is showing that structural inequality, right? That that this this ability to amass wealth has a lot of impact on on so many different choices and access and opportunity. Um, these doors that are open for white people that just aren't opened for people of color in the same way. So again, the next set of, of, of slides really gets into kind of what we're talking about these systems, right? These systems of inequality. Um, so this just really shows um, from, from a wealth perspective, from a financial perspective, um, you know, who controls the wealth uh, in terms of the population. Um, 90% of the national wealth is held by white families and Latino and black families, it's you know considerably uh, less. Uh, we know that things that are even happening through COVID-19, we've seen racial inequality just persist in so many ways of not only um, uh, rates of death um, in, in, in cities like New York and Chicago, the death rate for people of color has been substantially higher than for white people. Um, and that a lot of that gets into this, this, this access. If you have access to, you know, better health care, um, better uh, employment policies, um, even just housing, right? That's a huge thing that's going to be a protective factor for you in um, your own health, right? So health and wealth being connected in many ways. African Americans are two times as likely to be unemployed. Black students are three times more likely than white students to be suspended for the same infractions, right? If you've studied at all this cradle to prison pipeline, um, you know, we looking at school data that we see students of color suspended and given disciplinary action that's much more severe than their white peers for doing the exact same offense. Right? And so it's not comparing, you know, a worse offense to something that's less, but the same thing, the punishment and the, the um, response is much different. Um, even for those of you working in early childhood, um, there's been lots of studies that have looked at uh, preschool expulsion rates for, for African-American children, that they're um, labeled as having problem behavior and being, um, you know, just not labeled in a positive or favorable way and expelled from preschools at a much higher rate than their white counterparts. Um, African-Americans make up 13% of the general population, but 40% of the prison population. And I imagine that's probably a little bit higher even now. Um, so even now with the history that I gave you about housing, even now, African Americans are shown 18% fewer homes um, and 4% fewer rental units than whites. So even if they go through the process and get a pre-approved for a loan and they know that they can afford particular communities, they're literally not even given access to view housing in particular areas, right? So these are all the ways that these structural things continue to persist, right? In, in ways that many of us don't even see, right? We might say, well, I don't see this every day, but it's happening every day in, in all these different communities. One video that I showed in a previous presentation even talked about when uh, people of color, particular African Americans are going to buy a car, that the price that they're offered on the same car is higher than it would be to a white person, right? So just this, the way that um, all of our, all of these institutions, all of the, um, the entities that we interface with every day, um, there's always that risk for inequality. And so until that is addressed, until that is surfaced, we're not going to be able to get to a point place where we can say, you know, that we have equity, that we have um, justice, right? All of those things have to be constantly discussed and talked about and surfaced. These studies also look at um, African American drivers being more likely to be pulled over, um, um, also bias in the healthcare system, which we talked about. I just contributed to an article that's in the Tennessean today. Um, that uh, talks about a young African-American male who was pulled over in a suburb of Nashville, a wealthy suburb. He lives there and he was pulled over for what the police officer said was a routine traffic stop. Um, you know, he had expired tags, even though they're letting, you know, 
people have a little bit more grace period now with with coronavirus. Um, the cops said, you know, we're pulling people over. We're just letting giving them a warning to get your tags, um, you know, to 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 renew them, and and all that is is fine. But this young male was literally had his life flash before him. Right, he was consumed with fear, and you see that that disconnect where, in the eyes of the police officer, he said, "I'm just doing something that's routine." But in the eyes of this young black male, he literally thought that he could die, right, because of all of the historical and residual trauma that has gotten under his skin that has caused him to feel a particular way in this encounter. And so imagine that's something that we would just pass by on the side of the street and maybe not even think about. And that was something that had a profound impact on this young man. And so all of that leads us to know that these are realities that are very um, present. And if we care about the work that we do, if we care about the families and communities that we work in, and even if we don't have maybe a lot of people of color in our community, if we care just about being a good individual of, of having a, 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 a desire to be more just in our ideas, our practices, we have to care deeply about these things and we have to make changes, demand changes. This is, this is something that I think is so important because as I said before, a lot of people get caught up in guilt as they're going through this and they feel bad. Um, we, it's not that people of color necessarily are asking for you to apologize for things that you might say, well, I'm not responsible for this. I can't help what my ancestors or my great, great grandparents were, were responsible for. Nobody's asking you to feel bad about things that were you know, before your time. Um, but first of all, look at the things that are within you still that you benefit from and, and look to take responsibility for the ways that you can change those systems to make them more just. So we've reached the point of our presentation where we can really talk about kind of how do we begin to do that? We've touched on that, but um, I want you to look at this triangle for a minute. I'm gonna keep it up on the screen for a minute. And I really want you to think about where, where you might fall. Um, there's a lot of things in here that maybe you're not fully aware of what they all mean. But again, if this is sort of the analogy of that iceberg. What we see above the line of that, you know, above the triangle, the small part of the triangle are often things that people label as racist, socially unacceptable, horrible. Oh, I would never do that. I would never tell that joke. I would never say that word. I would never, you know, commit that horrible crime. And they they relegate racism to just those, those acts or those statements, not realizing that all the things underneath this surface are ways that either we've perpetuated um, white supremacy or participated in it ourselves, right? From the curriculum that our students uh, learn at school to things that we might have said, things that we might have ignored, um, you know, just ideas that we might have uh, perpetuated in conversations with people, um, just all of the things that we might be responsible for. And again, it's not to make us feel bad, but it's to make us say, how can I change this? How can I look at this and realize that there are some things that I need to adjust in my life, um, some, some actions that I need to take to go the other way, to move away from these things so that I can ensure that my life, that my behavior, that my thoughts, my actions aren't simply non-racist, non-oppressive, but anti-racist, that I'm moving in the other direction, right? That I'm not only just standing still, but I'm taking an active stance to refute these things, to, to move towards uh, pursuing justice. Part of the way that this starts is just by thinking about the words that we use, right? Many of us might have found ourselves using, these are just a handful of words, there's hundreds of others, but using these words or when we've heard these words said in the media or by people that we know, either ignoring them. Um, and so this is a really tangible way that we can begin to change this. When we hear um, people that we know or we hear ourselves think some of these thoughts or say them, we can take a step back and say, wait a minute, this isn't, these are not words that are perpetuating a stance of anti-racism or anti-oppression. So when we say things like, oh, that person's an illegal alien, that's not a term that we want to use. We can use the term undocumented, but not illegal alien. Um, oh, I bet that person's a welfare queen. Look at them using their food stamps card at the store something that we want to say and not that we want to say oh i just won't say it in front of that person we want to ask ourselves why is it that i why is it that i would think that why am i saying that 
do I know this person's story? Um, do I do I have the right to label them when they're um, gaining access to a benefit that they need to support their family? Right. Even terms like good schools, bad schools, good neighborhoods, bad neighborhoods. A lot of people use these terms, and I know that there may not be harm that you are intending to perpetuate when you say these things, but what that usually means for people is good schools, good neighborhoods are associated with white areas, right? Affluent areas um, and bad schools, bad neighborhoods, bad communities, bad zip codes are typically associated with um, poor and or communities of color. Now, if you're in a rural area and there's not a lot of people of color, maybe it's just associated solely with, with people in poverty. But typically, it's both people in poverty and, you know, uh, people of color. What that does when we create that binary of good and bad or, um, you know, lazy and hardworking or um, caring and negligent is, um, first of all, groups all the people within that area in one particular way. And it doesn't look at the structural or institutional uh, things that have contributed to why a particular neighborhood might be the way that they are, or the way that it is. Again, if we think back to the example I gave about housing, right? The way housing was created, right? Our public housing, for example, in Nashville, what we would call the projects, was created very specifically and intentionally, um, you know, in a, in, in a way to segregate people, right? Um, if that's the case, and we see that that's how it's perpetuated, instead of saying, oh, that's a bad neighborhood, we could say that that's a neighborhood that has been historically oppressed and people in that neighborhood have not had the same amount of access and entry points as people just up the street from you know, that neighborhood, right? It speaks to the kinds of conditions that have contributed to poor housing conditions, lack of funding for schools, et cetera, in, in low-income communities, rather than blaming the people, right? We say fight poverty, not poor people, right? Um, don't look at and 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 blame individuals um, within communities, but look at the kinds of conditions or opportunities that they have that they have lacked that have contributed to the situation that they're in. And I think that's so important. It's a really honest place to start within each of us. Um, and I have to correct myself at times. You know, none of us again is immune to this. Even though I've been doing this work for a long time, I spend a lot of time in communities that. That are that people would consider to be, you know, those neighborhoods. I love the people in in different communities, and yet I have to watch myself because biases easily creep in, right? Now I'm also not saying that you know you deny the fact that like, oh, you know, there's no crime that goes on here. I'm just going to pretend with rose-colored glasses. I'm not saying that you do that, right? You have to be realistic. If if there is crime that exists in a community, but ask yourself why. Are people committing crime? I don't agree with it. I don't justify it. I don't think that it's right, but there's a lack of opportunity in a particular community that has led people to a sense of frustration and has caused this particular outcome. Again, I don't agree with it. I don't justify it, but I understand it as a root cause versus just something that is, is inherent to a race of people or a particular zip code, right? Not everybody in that zip code and not nearly many of the people in that zip code are per perpetuating that, right? They're not criminal, they're not dangerous people, right? In any way. So when I make these claims about particular neighborhoods, particular people, um, it, it really is, it's, it's, it's not furthering our desire for a more just world. And I particularly wanna tune into this in thinking about the way that we talk to, for those of you who have children or you're around young people, this becomes what they hear from us becomes the way that they see the world. So if they see us saying something or not saying something, or you know, they watch our body language change when we're around a particular group of people. Um, you know, and again, I'm not talking about like walking at night in a in a in a community, you know, I'm talking about you're in the mall in the middle of the day and you grab your purse because you see a particular person, or you know, you uh drive through a community and you start saying negative things about the people that live there, you immediately lock your doors and, and, and think that you're going to be a, a, a victim of crime. What does that communicate to somebody, right? You can, you can have precaution that you take across the board, right? Um, as you get in your car, but if you're only communicating single narratives, single stories that about particular areas, you're passing that on to the people around you 
Um, and, and, and that's really shaping their ideas too. So these things not only have um, an impact on our own thinking, but also they impact the other people who are listening to us and who are paying attention and trying to make sense of the world based on what we uh, share, what we present. I also want us to think about some of the theories maybe that we've been taught in, in school or some of even, even those of us who, who like to read research studies now or even the data that we look at for our own, our own job, right? Sometimes um, the things that are published, the things that are available are not always operating from an equitable lens. And so just as we have to teach our kids to you know, look at their textbooks in a particular way and make sure that their textbooks aren't portraying particular groups of people in a negative way, right? Because that's a, a reality. We also have to do that in our own continued quest for, um, for uh, learning and knowledge. And in particular, you not, not all of you might be familiar with this study, but this was a study that I learned about in graduate school back in 2000 <laughs> for my, uh, my master's program. And it was one of those, what they call a seminal study. It was one of those things that, that people hung a lot of their hats on. In fact, I even have a book that was written that, that I was given in graduate school based off of this study. And I had no idea when I was reading it at the time that, um, that it that it could be viewed in a more deficit way. I thought, yeah, that makes sense. You know, um, they these researchers did a study looking at you know parents talking to their kids and found that you know low income parents don't talk to their kids as much as wealthier parents. And when they do talk to their kids, they basically admonish them more or or use negative um, you know retorts to them. I I learned about this study and I thought, okay, yeah, well that means we've got to those of us in early education, we've got to you know, get out there and promote early literacy. Yes, we do. Yes, we do, right? And again, it's not that this study is false, but this study is incomplete because what this study didn't do was look at the different places and the different ways that low income and working class families interact with their kids. So it, it brought kids into like a, um, a, a study, um, a research lab, sorry, I lost my words for a minute, brought them into a research lab in a very contrived, controlled setting and looked at it from that lens and didn't look at the fact that, you know, um, lots of these conversations for, for families were happening in a whole lot of different places. It also had a narrow way of, you know, if parents aren't, you know, talking to their children through book reading, well, they could be singing to their kids. They could be telling made up stories. They could be doing lots of different things that aren't necessarily just the 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 one way that we've we know to be important again book reading is very important don't hear me saying that it's not it's extremely important but we've got to look more broadly at even some of these studies so it's not that this study isn't true and it's not that this study isn't important the study was one of the first to help us realize the importance of language development and making sure that early literacy is is so crucial so that we don't have kids that are starting school with this gap in knowledge, this word gap, if you will. But what it what it failed to do was um, sort of blame it, 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 the the narrative that went along with the study in some ways blamed um, the families and kind of talked about this culture of poverty. Right? We've seen other scholars like Ruby Payne talk about this and it paints a broad brush um, that's very deficit oriented, right? Um, and doesn't necessarily look at all the individual differences and all the different ways that families might be trying to, to, to change this reality um, that might not have been captured in the study. So um, I, I just want to caution you not to say that this, this study is true. It's not a false study. It's, it's a, it's a, it was helpful to get people to really understand um, the importance of talking to kids early and often. There's no doubt about that. But it also put a lot of blame on parents in poverty and almost made it look like if you're in poverty, you're not doing a very good job raising your kids. Um, and that's a very dangerous slope to go down. And it's not something that we want to perpetuate in our own work. Um, we want to look at the barriers that families in poverty face and the, the, the kinds of structural things that make it hard for them to be their best parent, the, the best version of themselves. But when we get into some of the blaming and shaming 
um, and, and, and labels. It just doesn't do us any good in our work. So instead of these deficit perspectives, we really want to move towards what we call a hope or strength or an asset framework, right? Where we understand the challenges that are present. We're not denying the, the, the things that are difficult. We're not denying the fact that, you know, there's complexities, um, but we're, we're looking at that at how do we reframe these things as an opportunity for growth, right? We're also refusing to be in an all or nothing kind of binary in our mind. You know that everyone is all wrong or all bad or, or or not doing well or doing this all the time or none of the time and we're looking at you know what families are doing the best they can in this situation and we're going to wrap ourselves around and figure out what we can do to strengthen it so that some of these these hard points these difficult things are improved right um so i want you to think about how can you utilize a hope or strengths perspective in your work how can you ask the why how can you get at the root Right? How can you, you, you unpeel the layers to understand what's going on underneath the surface that might explain why this parent isn't talking that much to the child, right? Instead of just thinking, oh, it's because they're poor. Oh, they don't care. Right? Oh, it's because they're this race or this ethnicity or this religion that they must not be as involved in their child's life or not doing as much for their community, et cetera. Trying to get underneath, what's the reason? And that leads me to really thinking about this analogy of using both of our hands, right? So we always want to be operating from what I call an individual and a systems perspective. When we work from an individual level, that's what we're most of us are doing every day, right? Building relationships with families, with children, with communities, um, you know, attending trainings and workshops, being a part of, of events in our community that address disparities, right? Bringing food to a family in need, um, you know, providing clothing. Those are all necessary things, right? We don't want to stand back and just say, well, until the system can fit, can fix the issue of poverty, I'm just going to let it, let it be. No, we want to dive in and we want to know if this family needs diapers and formula and it's Friday and they don't have it, I'm going to make sure they get it. But I'm also going to do the work to understand how has the system failed them that they're not getting what they need, right? So, for example, a mom that I work with right now, she uh, sent me a text message the other day and said, um, I didn't realize that I had to recertify myself every three months for WIC. And because of COVID-19, maybe she didn't get the, the, the message or something. And so she said, I've run out of formula. Now, I'm not going to sit back and say, well, the system is what it is and you need to do your work. I'm No, I'm going to get her formula for her baby, right? But I'm also going to find out what she needs to do to access that system so that this doesn't happen again. Or I'm going to say, what is it about the system that didn't allow her to have a a just experience like did they not reach out to her did they not you know let her know this or were they not you know were they not operating properly so i'm going to do both of those things i'm going to figure out where i can meet that immediate need but i'm also going to look at the bigger um thing that's operating All right for some of us that might be examining policies and procedures in our organization right do we have fair hiring practices do we are we doing enough to promote and support um you know, racial and ethnic minorities in our workplace? Um, or, or does our leadership all look one way? And if it does, why is that? Um, and that doesn't just mean bringing in one person of color to work there, but what are we doing to, to bring in a lot of different voices and a lot of different backgrounds and, and encourage and support people to be their full selves, right? Writing letters to our, our representatives and advocating for these issues, showing up for different policy events. I know that the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth has a lot of these amazing days at the Hill and, and, and advocacy opportunities, showing up for those things, but then saying, what do I do next, right? Where can I follow up? How can I let my voice be known? There's some significant bills that have come across the, the, the legislature in the, in the state of Tennessee, and I won't get into all of them, but they're things that are, are really, um, upsetting to me that they didn't that they that they didn't uh, move forward. And what I found out from one of the bills that was really something to promote educational justice um, in, in more or less words was that the, the the individuals who voted against it said, well, we didn't know that our constituents cared that much about the issue. If we had known, we would have thought otherwise. All right. So by using your voice, Letting people know either that if, if you agree with a particular politician that they're advocating for these issues, let them know, I agree with you. Don't just sit back and say, well, they're already doing it. Let them know, yeah, I feel good about how you're advocating for this. Or if they're doing 
voting on something or going against your belief, writing a letter. There's so many um, ways that we can get involved in that way. Again, within our own, own organizations, but also beyond that within the, the agencies and institutions that kind of govern our work. Um, so important to, to think about how we use both of our hands. And finally, this goes more back to that kind of personal level, but I want you to each of you to think about the voices and the perspectives that are influencing your life, right? If you were to have a jar in front of you and I were to give you a bag of marbles, right? And I would ask you to put a marble in your jar for each time you could say that you um, have interacted with a circle of friends that are of a different race than you, especially if you're if you're part of the dominant group, right? Do you have a, a variety of friends? Because research tells us that for people of color, they don't really have a choice. They they're they're mostly surrounded by white people, so their social circles tend to be you know more diverse than white people who whose social circles and community circles tend to be more segregated. So if I asked you to put a, a marble in your jar of, you know, and I'm not just talking about, oh, I know somebody, but do I have real authentic friendships that allow me to be real, that that allow the other person to share their truth and for me not to deny it or minimize it? How do, how do, how do, their, how do voices that are diverse influence my thinking about different things? on a friendship level, on a neighborhood level, right? And again, this is not to make you feel bad about where you live, but if you don't live in a diverse community, how are you and with your family and your, you know, your friend group, how are you spending time getting to know neighborhoods that are unlike your own, right? Again, not just passing through, but really understanding and valuing the fabric of different communities, right? Well, how they contribute to your vitality and your well-being. And then finally thinking about like, you know, the, the sources of media that we take in, books, movies, podcasts, documentaries. Um, there's so many different ways that we can get information now. It's hard for me to believe that people aren't sure where to start when it comes to this piece because there's so much. I mean, you can just ask Google, right? And, and you can begin to do that work yourself to understand, um, you know, all of these different voices and to hear it from Hear the stories directly from the source, not somebody else writing about it, but directly from people who are impacted by it. Um, all of these things are just a small part, but they do contribute to countering the implicit biases that we develop, right? We're giving ourselves a new narrative. We're creating a new picture in our mind to supplement or to perhaps replace what may have been distorted or misconstrued. So again, I asked you to think about what was in your jar on a personal level, on a professional context. How have you utilized your voice to speak up and advocate for changes in policies, practices, behaviors, and actions that might be racist or oppressive to individuals within your organization, individuals from marginalized identities? So people who are not part of that privileged group, if you think about that earlier slide when it comes to race, class, gender, ability, religion, family structure. Are there people like that in your agency or the families that you serve? And how are you ensuring that their voices are heard, that their perspectives are encouraged and deeply valued? And if you haven't done this, what will it take for you to encourage yourself to leverage your voice and your actions this way? You know, how can you set some goals for yourself to move forward in this way so that you can get there? Not to feel bad if you haven't gotten there, but just to, to think about how you can move forward. I talked about the importance of becoming actively anti-racist, anti-oppressive, not just non, non-racist, but anti-racist. Um, this seems like a little bit of like a harsh uh, metaphor, but there's a, a video that that uh, the scholar talks about. If we replace the word racist with the word rapist, okay, a horrible word, rapist. We wouldn't say, I'm not a rapist. We would say, I'm anti-rapist, right? I'm, I'm against rape. I'm just not that. I'm just not going to say I'm not that. I'm against it, right? We want to take this active stance of refuting it. So you could take out the word racist and repl you know, replace it with lots of other things, but we want to remove ourselves from a neutral stance or being kind of in the middle, maybe where it's comfortable, maybe where we haven't said much, maybe where we've been more silent and move ourselves towards a much more active stance where we are calling things out. We're much more aware. The lens that we put on is a lens towards justice and not just, oh, everybody's the same, right? 
Um, it's about being deliberate. It's about being intentional. Um, it's about listening to people of color when they talk about racism and they talk about inequality and injustice, not denying it or minimizing their story or, you know, thinking that, oh, maybe it wasn't that way, but really hearing their reality and, and, and listening and sitting with that. We've seen a lot more of that happening. I'm encouraged by um, a lot more that I'm seeing in different spheres um, of communities around Tennessee and, and elsewhere. And so I hope that people will continue that momentum, that it won't be just a moment, but it will be a movement. So in conclusion, um, one of the strongest tools for combating bias is, is what we call consciousness raising. So how do we move all that 98% that's under the iceberg to the tip of the iceberg so that we can see it, we can feel it, we can, we can re realize that it's a reality? It takes recognizing this. It takes making ourselves aware when we have a thought that maybe we don't like. We, we encounter somebody that's different. We, we, we think that something that we don't like, we don't like it. But instead of pushing it away, we engage it and we talk ourselves through it. And we try to think about replacing it with other experiences that we have that would um, bring us a different reality. Moving from the comfort zone to the contact zone, again, creating more meaningful opportunities for real authentic connections with people who are different from you, right? There's lots of ways to do that. Um, there's lots of organization, even if you can't do that in your own community, you know, tuning into lots of different things that are available online just to get to know the perspectives and the voices of people. Doing an inventory of your personal and professional life with an eye for bias. Again, that's some of those questions I asked you before to think about. Um, talking to friends, kids, family members um, about this, this awakening within you, right? Encouraging yourself to continue on the journey. I, I like to call it soul work. It really is soul work. Um, it's not something that we just get through um, on one sitting, but we're continuously striving towards what it means to be a good ally. And we don't ever arrive at that and say, okay, I'm done now because I've done this, I've read this, I've listened to this. We're, we're consistently on that journey. Challenging other people, you know, um, in your life to think critically about racism, right? You know, asking the hard questions when you hear things. Somebody uh, reached out to me yesterday, a neighbor of mine, she said that her boss posted something on social media that was really offensive. And she said, well, before, and then they're both white. She said, before I would have just said nothing because that's my boss. And, you know, she's like, but I want to move from that stance of non to anti. And I want to say something, what do I do? And so I talked her through kind of thinking about asking, how do you ask some questions back? Right? Rather than just getting on there and saying, I disagree with this. How do you ask them some questions about, you know, why would you post something like that? What do you think you get out of it? Or who, who really believes that? Or who sees it that way? And and encouraging you know, her boss to, to listen to some other voices that, that, that this person was missing instead of just you know, kind of that. I like to say sometimes on social media, we're in a little bit of a, of a silo or an echo chamber. You know, we, we tend to be around other people who are, who are just like us. And so how can we expand that? Um, asking questions, but not burdening our colleagues of color with a barrage of questions. Again, doing our own work. If we were going to take a trip somewhere, or if we were going to, you know, uh, make a big life change to move to a different country, we would ask some people, but we'd also do a lot of our own research. We'd get online, we'd buy books, we'd look at blogs and, and read articles by people who live there. So it's the same thing, right? Yes, we can ask if we have good close relationships with people of color, we can occasionally ask questions, but we also want to do our own research, right? So that we're finding these things out for ourselves that we can you know, question that like, oh, I was reading about this. What do you think about that? Right. But you've gained some information. You've shown people that you're willing to do some work on your own as well. That's the next point about education. And then finally, surrounding yourself with individuals who are actively also seeking an informed anti-racist, anti-oppressive perspective. Right. We need support in numbers. <laughs> we need to find other people who we can who can encourage us and we can encourage them on this journey. Um, that's such a crucial piece of this capacity building. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, these are some questions I wanna leave with you and then we'll open it up for some, some chat questions through the chat. But I want you to sit, think about one to two ideas, concepts or messages that you've learned today or maybe just things you've been thinking about recently. Something that you believe you can implement right away. What is something like, you know, you think about students at the end of a lesson at school, they fill out an exit ticket of something they learned right away. 
I want you to think about what is a change I can make today, you know, this weekend. And then what are some things that I, that might take a little bit longer to implement or change, but that I'm committed to, right? What are some things that in my professional life, I might not want to make a change in my program, my agency, et cetera. It's not going to happen tomorrow or next week, but I'm, I'm committed to seeing it through. Um, and, and you can use these prompts to help you. I will, I can, I need to. Some other prompts that are helpful are, what do I need to start doing? What do I need to stop doing? And what do I need to continue doing? What do I need to start doing? What do I need to stop doing? And what do I need to continue doing? And that's all that I have for you guys. Thank you so much. I'll open it up for uh, about 15 minutes of questions and look forward to the dialogue. Thank you, Dr. Avi Soto. I think Christy Failing is going to come on. Um, she will wrap us up and then we will I have some questions. Uh, okay. but we will um, we'll let Christy wrap it up for some folks that can't stay on for their questions. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Avi Soto, for that powerful presentation. It was certainly our pleasure to host this WebEx with such timely information. So on behalf of all the regional coordinators, uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us today and engaging in this meaningful presentation. Um, all recordings will be available on our TCCY website. That's tn.gov slash TCCY. Under the publications tab, click on the videos. Um, as a reminder, if you're calling in today and need a CEU certificate or an NASW certificate, uh, purchase our certificate of participation, Please email Lindsay Cody, that's L I N D S E Y dot Cody, C O D Y, at tn.gov with your name and phone number. Um, all attendees will be receiving an email next week with your certificates and membership information about joining our local councils. So um, I'd just like to say take care, everyone, and we do hope that you'll join us for future offerings. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to you, Dr. So uh, Ivy Soto, and um, Jill uh, to do the moderation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Uh, our first question. Um, some are comments and questions. Um, from what I know, people of color have been so attacked because of their race, and it seems like it has been so internalized that they do not try to fight against it. I have seen this from my own hometown. How can we combat this? How can we let these groups know to rise up while sternly educating others to let go of racial ways of thinking we might have been taught? It's a great question. So one of the things that we know from research, and I if you remember when I talked about racism being like the smog that we breathe, remember everybody's breathing that smog. So everybody is impacted by racism. Um, and, and we see that people of color um, at times will internalize some of the, the, the detrimental and negative beliefs about their own people group, right? If you looked at in the 1960s when researchers did the doll study, and you can go on and Google the doll study, they found, you know, young children of all races, but even young children, black, black young children would have negative things to say about the black dolls in the study. They did a current uh, version of that doll study just a few years ago on a, on a research uh, team and found the same thing, which shows us that sadly, uh, people of color have internalized some of the, the oppression that they have faced because of racism that exists in society. So in response to what we do about that, I think that hopefully as we see this shift happening, I hope in our country of a, of a deeper level of awakening, a soul awakening of the injustice, that as African Americans and other people of color start to see white people acknowledging more of the racism, hopefully that will encourage them to not silence their own voices. Um, I think also some of it can be generational, right? I've noticed since I've moved to the South that um, sometimes when I give presentations, sometimes, and this is not a blanket statement at all, but sometimes people who have lived through, obviously a lot more life experience than I have, have come up and said to me, well, you're just speaking too strongly. And, and these are African-American people, you know, tone it down a little bit. You're saying too much. It's too, 
it, it's too much. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. I think we really need to be vocal about this. And, and, and it shows me that unfortunately they have for so long been made to feel silenced that they're almost afraid of what might happen if they actually use their voice. So hopefully if they, if, if we see more people from privileged backgrounds using their voices, it will chip away at some of that pain that people of color have had to adapt to and, and, and develop um, and allow them to, to, to utilize their voices a little bit more strongly. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, do you think that if we go back and start teaching again in schools, the era of era of oppression, teach the history to the younger generations today, do you believe it would make a difference in today's youth and their outlook on all races and religions? So I think it's part of I think that definitely um, our education system needs a pretty big overhaul to be much more thoughtful and intentional about these conversations. I've seen some improvement, um, but I've also seen in communities where people have tried to even just bring up history lessons and use proper terminology like slavery, um, like you know, using uh, using words that are the, just the real context of what's happened that they've gotten a lot of pushback. Um, I'm not going to get into particular communities, but you know, even teachers that have taught about different world religions from a very neutral perspective, like just what's out of the textbook, and they've gotten a lot of pushback. And so, until we until we have a desire to tell the whole truth in, a, in, a, in an authentic way, I think if we keep skimming the surface in our schools, um, we're not really going to see a shift in developing really the empathy or the awareness that our young people need. I also think it's incumbent upon parents and especially parents from the dominant culture to have these conversations with kids starting from you know early childhood on. Right? And that's what I've seen more of people asking me questions. When should I start talking to my kids? What do I do? There's thousands of children's books now that begin to have that conversation just about racial differences, but then ones that even get into different conversations about racial inequality or other forms of, of inequality that, ex that exist. If our kids can figure out coding and complex gaming, pretty sure they can have a conversation about inequality that exists in society, right? So let's not tell our young people short. They're very capable and they want to have these conversations. They, they want to be aware of, of the world around them. And sadly, if we rely on them to get education from other sources, they're going to be many times misinformed. So yes, our education system, but also families, um, you know, what you bring in the home. There's so many great community events and things that you can attend that are free that can also bring about a level of awareness, but not only just attending something, having a conversation with your kids after, you know, about what they saw, about what they experienced. And even if you don't know the answers to those questions, say, hey, we're going to we're going to look it up together. We're going to do research together. There's, there's just there's a, an, an endless amount of information out there, but it's just about starting to chip away at it and, and doing it often. Thank you. Um, Bristol, Tennessee and Virginia, that's, you know, right on the line of Virginia and Tennessee. So Bristol, um, had a meeting, yes, had their first meeting of African American leaders, city leaders and law enforcement officials yesterday. Lots of young, young folks involved. How do allies let our African American community lead the discussions needs reforms without seeming to throw the work over the fence or without putting undue pressure on our black community and how do we share the workload without taking away the power from the from their black community that's a great idea and i think some of that starts with just leaning in and listening at first you know um I, I, it's a it's a delicate balance between learning uh, learning and listening to but then also not expecting um only the african-american community to lead everything right so I think it's about how do we help, how do we allow the people who are being impacted to develop the priorities and the goals and initiatives, but then walk alongside and say, okay, here's what's here's what you've laid out. How can I walk alongside you and shoulder some of this burden without walking in front of you, you know, without stepping in and taking over, but being able to walk alongside. So letting people really uh, tell the story from their own perspective and share what they need, but saying, hey, I'm here. I want to be here to walk alongside you. You let me know when I can step in and 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 be a part of this movement, but I don't want to step over you. So I think it's just keeping that proximity close 
And if you remind people that you're available and give tangible ways, hey, I can step in and lead this discussion or co-lead, or I can I can talk to people in the white community about this if you want me to, you know, just giving um, tangible ways that you could uh, be a partner in the work without overstepping and taking over. It's a great question though. Thank you. I'm white and have been anti-racist for years. It's surprising how many white people I know who are blind to the, to the racism. In that vein, I'm curious to know if there is a racism quiz. You know, on Facebook, people love insightful quizzes. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of like the five love, language, five love languages quiz, because I'm frustrated trying to help my white friends understand their racist thoughts and actions. And I am constantly revisiting my own racist thoughts and would love to drill to drill down. Yeah, there are um, there's a lot of great books. There's a, a book called uh, White Fragility. That's really good. There's another one called um, I think it's called Me White Supremacy. Um, that is very helpful for people um, in this work. Just looking it up to make sure I have the title right. Me and White Supremacy, Combating Racism, Changing the World and Becoming a Good Ancestor. Um, there are quizzes. Um, I, I think sometimes that that's um, I think it's a good starting place. Uh, for example, the Pew Research Center, which has a lot of great data, Pew, P-E-W, there is a quiz that I've given to my students called Who Shares Your Views on Race? Um, and that looks at kind of general questions about different um, issues around race and racism. So I think quizzes can be helpful, but I think I think more depthful reading, um, and I know that's, that not everybody has that time. So yes, it's a place to start. Um, there's certainly lots of like white privilege checklists. Uh, if you Google that, I believe that the author of White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo, may have a white privilege checklist or something like that. So that's also a checklist to begin, because that's another term that people bristle at. But just to begin to say what it really means is that there's an advantage based on whiteness. And so what is how does that manifest itself in your life every day? And, and a lot of times when people can see that through some sort of a quiz, they can begin to say, oh, okay, I didn't realize that that's what it was saying. It just, it means that, you know, my, my white skin is an advantage. It doesn't mean that I haven't had to work hard. It doesn't mean that I haven't had other things that might've been difficult, but race is not one of them. And so, yeah, some of those uh, checklists or quizzes are helpful. Oh, I lost your volume, Jill. Would it help if I unmuted myself? That's okay. Um, the next question, can you talk a little more about the white savior complex? Mm -hmm. So this is another thing that I think is very delicate. Um, when I think of the white savior complex, I think of um, some, for many people starting off with good intentions of, you know, doing work in communities of color. Um, a lot of times it comes in the form of like teaching or, you know, nonprofit work, or even quote unquote, you know, people who do mission type work. <clears throat> And the intention is to go in and make a difference. Where it becomes dangerous is when we, when it becomes very self-serving, when your, um, your desire becomes more about showcasing and highlighting what you've done to uh, make a difference in the lives of these broken kids or families versus how resilient uh, the families themselves are, right? So I'm not saying it's wrong to take a picture with your students if you're a teacher. But I think it's wrong for people to constantly, you know, take selfies and, you know, if they're like on a mission trip or something and then tell these stories of the poor, impoverished kids that they were helping that, you know, had nothing until we came in or something like that. It, it, it perpetuates this deficit narrative about who people are and that you're there to fill them up, not that they were already whole people and you're there to just, you know, enhance some of the things that, you know, they may need. Um, I think all other ways that white saviorism is perpetuated is through a lot of what we see in the media. Some of my students, their favorite, because I, you know, education professor, their favorite education movies are very white savior driven of, you know, the teacher who goes and works in the tough school, who turns the kids around. And it's all about centering the teacher, right? And, and what he or she did to make the difference. And again, it's not to deny that people are going in to make a difference and to do good things, but it, it, it becomes all about them, right? So. I think that to be careful of those things is to just look at who is the attention on, who is the uh, who is looking to be centered, 
in the conversation or the um, the story or just the everyday you know work. If you're looking to center center the white person and all the great things that they're doing, that's that's probably going down the path of white saviorism. It doesn't mean you can't look at the positive things that you've done to make a difference. Okay, that there's nothing wrong with that. But it's are you looking at people as to fill them up, or are you looking at people as um, underserved and not able to reach their full capacity because of structural inequality? And you're there to help shine a spotlight on that and change that. Thank you. I work in a school system. How do we help our te all teachers become aware of our biases and make sure we treat children better? And how do we help our school board see inequities? It's a great question. So a lot of what schools do initially is take an inventory inventory of their discipline data, right? Looking at who's getting in trouble, how they're getting in trouble. Um, also, you know, because a lot of times schools tend to have much more um, disproportionate rates of, of um, discipline towards their students of color or towards their students with disabilities. Um, and that's something I think that, that, that you can begin to look at. Also looking at from a school district perspective, um, who is in your honors classes, who are in your AP classes. If you're, if you're in a fairly diverse area or if there's any diversity and you're noticing that those opportunities are only being offered to um, white students or even the designation of gifted if you're in a school district that, that offers that, that's something to look at, right? Who's being, um, who's being observed and, and, and I'm not hanging all my hat on, on those labels, but just when we're looking at equity, um, are we giving kids of color or, or um, English learners an opportunity to also um, assess them for these things? Um, and not just looking at, you know, kids who are coming from maybe higher socioeconomic backgrounds or who we assume to have better, um, you know, educational outcomes, but we're looking at it holistically. The other thing is just, again, kind of looking at the curriculum and a lot of teachers say, I don't have time, you know, I have to teach what I have to teach. And that is true, but there's other ways that you can supplement the curriculum with the kind of books that you send home or the kind of, you know, even morning meeting activities that you do with students to try to raise their consciousness about these things. It doesn't have to get political, right? Human rights aren't political, they're just human rights. If you, if you, if you talk about the importance of social justice, if you talk about the importance of equity, if you talk about the injustices that are happening in the world, that's not taking a side, that's building awareness in your students. And so those are ways I think that teachers can begin to do that kind of on the individual classroom level, Again, looking at sort of the policies and procedures that are at the school um, with an eye for equity. Um, I've done a lot of trainings and book clubs with teachers that, you know, try, trying to read more and learn more together, but then having accountability measures. So not just we're going to read this book together, but we're also going to talk about how these, how we're going to allow this information to transform our teaching and our curriculum. So holding ourselves accountable, um, asking our leadership those kind of questions and staying at it, you know, I think. I know I'm in schools every day. It's such a, it's the it's an incredibly intense work um, just to just to teach. And so I don't want people to think that that I'm saying this is sort of like oh just do it. But if you figure out ways to just embed this into your day to day work and have these conversations often, um, maybe that's creating a equity task force at your school and and you lead that. Um, it'll begin to be more organic into the fabric of the school, and then I think hopefully more people will you know, uh, take that responsibility on. And along with that question, um, what books could uh, you recommend for K through 12 educators to raise their awareness and knowledge? So a lot of people like the book Courageous Conversations About Race. It's written like by a principal, um, particularly a, as a way for, you know, teachers to kind of work through. Um, I think the book I talked about earlier, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria by Beverly Daniel Tatum. Again, it's an older book, but it's very, um, very relevant. Um, I, I'm, I can send some other uh, additional offerings, but there's um, great articles, even on uh, the website Chalkbeat. Uh, Chalkbeat has a lot of great articles, and, and then a lot of them are specific to Tennessee. I know we have people from other states too, but that talk about inequality. Um, even articles on Edutopia. So if you don't have time to read a whole book, um, there's a great book called, um, oh goodness, I wanna make sure I get the, the title correct. I think it's called for, 
for white, I used it last year. I'm sorry, my brain is like, I think it's called for white teachers. Yes, for white teachers who teach in the hood and for everybody else. And then for the rest of y'all too. It's it's by Chris Emden. Um, he's a brilliant scholar. He has a lot of TED Talks. Um, E-M-D-I-N is how you spell his last name. And and uh, that's a great book too, very accessible. Um, there's so many uh, excellent books that are out there, but I think, you know, just, even even just googling basic articles, there's there's really so many things that are available now for educators um, that I think would get the conversation going. And and you'll see in the resource list that is at the end of my presentation, you'll find some things there as well as videos. Thank you. I think we have one or two more questions. Um, think the protest going on now will actually be an impetus to start making real changes that will continue and not stop when the protests now yeah this <laughs> end yeah um i'm hopeful because i'm hopeful because i see people who who have not um participated or leveraged their voice coming and so I, I think it's a really good sign there. I see more of an awakening of a uncovering, if you will. Um, I think that we have to just keep at it. Right. And, and not necessarily in the form of protest. I don't mean that, but like in the, um, just continue to encourage people who we see doing this to keep at it. Like what's your reading list for the summer? What documentaries are you watching? There's so much circulating right now on, on social media. That's, you know, giving people a list of things to read, watch, listen. And so, just encouraging people to stay accountable on those things and not just, um, you know, you might use the next couple of months just to educate yourself and not necessarily be speaking out a lot. But then once you have more information, you start speaking out. And so just just continuing, just not not giving up, being really having what I call a relentless pursuit. You just keep pursuing it as much as you can when you're able, um, but that you don't let it just get you for a moment, but you really just um, continue to see its value for your whole life, really. Thank you. I think doing it with other people too. It helps build that capacity when you have an accountability. Sure. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Um, sure. Okay, we'll take uh, two more. Um, and this one, could you speak on cultural appropriation? Um, and she gave an example. She was given a gift from a young friend from Ghana. It was a sundress made with traditional African fabric. Um, she loved it and and wore it once, but she wanted to make sure she was not offending. She didn't want to offend anyone, um, but also honor her friend. So yes, speak genuinely about cultural appropriation. It's a great question. So, um, what I see with cultural appropriation is the way that um, people are using symbols and. Um, even the way that they are uh, changing their own look and as a way to imitate and many times make fun of other cultures. So, I mean, I've seen all these pictures surface recently of, you know, teenagers painting their faces black and, you know, using the N-word. I mean, that's that's sick, that's racism, but that's also, you know, just a, a complete disrespect. Um, so I think there's that there's that end of it. There's also, uh, we see, you know, at when people tend to, to dress up for, you know, parties or things and, and wear different things that would um, be sacred uh, dress for different cultures. As far as your example of your friend giving you a dress, um, that's a, a more meaningful one to one, like your friend gave you something. Um, you understand the value of it. You understand the story behind it. Um, I don't see a, 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 a problem wearing it out. Um, and maybe, you know, if somebody asks you that you would have that you'd have some knowledge around it. Um, I think it becomes problematic when people, uh, you know, almost try to overdo it then, or maybe put too many things on, or 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 try to, you know, um, then think of themselves perhaps as having a deeper awareness of, let's say, black culture now because they're wearing a dress, which that's not at all what you're saying in your in your question. But I think wearing a gift is fine. Um, and 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 it's an honor to your friend, or maybe you wear it when you're going out with her, you know, as a way just to, to like we like to do when somebody gives us a gift and they like to see it, you know, on us. We we show that as a as a meaning of, of appreciation. So 
I think those kind of um, one to one connections are fine. I think we just have to be careful. We see a lot of our, our media stars, the people that our kids idolize that are appropriating black hairstyles, you know, clothing. Talking to our kids about that, like, why is it okay for a white person to wear dreads, but then a black person wears it and they're called disparaging things like those are the, the, the deeper parts of appropriation that I think are much more harmful and that we need to, you know, be more aware of. Thank you. Um, and the last question we have others, but in the, and being mindful of time. Um, I can remember as. I remember a time as a child in the 90s when there appeared to be more education about cultural diversity. There were many more TV shows about black families that seemed to promote a more positive image and less of the usual negative stereotypes. Do you think that there has been a regression and where did that begin to happen? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think on like primetime TV, yes. I mean, people love to think of like the Cosby show or even like Family Matters or a different world, like much more um, nuanced, complex, you know, beautiful images of families. I will say I see much, so so I miss those shows. I still watch them with my kids and they're not as you know, read, readily available, of course, now, but I do see more um, like documentaries, many more um, almost like mini series that are like on Netflix, which I know not everybody has access to, but are providing a much more um, full picture of the story of, of racial and ethnic identity. Um, for example, uh, oh goodness, I'm gonna forget this. I'm, I'm gonna look it up if you, if you don't mind for a minute. My family and I have been watching, um, um, it might be on, I think, I believe it's on Netflix. Um, there are stories of immigrants. Um, if I can't remember, Jill, I'll send it to you. Um, because I'm, it's, I'm totally thinking on it right now, uh, but they're, they're really wonderful. Uh, oh, Little America, that's what it's called, Little America. They're, they're 30 minute episodes that tell real stories of immigrant and refugee families. And that's, a, that's been a really powerful way for my family to kind of hear lots of different, you know, truths. These are real stories. They're played by actors, but they're real stories. And so, yes, I agree that there is a, a lack of like primetime shows um, but I do think there's also these other kinds of things that are available that tell um, that are amplifying diverse voices, um, which which I appreciate. Oh, I can't hear you again. I think you muted yourself. I'm trying to be mindful of my topic. Oh, it's okay. So. <laughs> I do it all the time. It's okay. So, thank you. Um, and again, just for the folks that are still on, we will be sending out. Um, some of Dr. Avi Soto's resources and links, um, as well as this is being recorded. So um, we'll give you, send you the link for that along with your certificate. It will be coming next week. So um, thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful and uh, a very appropriate time. So we look forward to yeah, seeing so you. Yes, and feel free, Jill. Um, in my last slide, I did have my email address. So feel free to pass on my email address. Um, if anybody wants to follow up with email, I'm happy to happy to talk to folks. So, okay, we've had a, we've had a couple to ask about speaking, so I'll make sure that we get get your email out to them, along with Great. other information. So, thank you so much. Thank you all. It's been wonderful. I've enjoyed my time and look forward to hopefully staying connected. Yes, definitely. Thank Have you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye. You too. Bye. -bye.
Don't forget to stop the recording. Yo, mine's logged out. Logged. Are you there? Yo. Yeah, I'm here. I, I, mine is like logged up and says that, that WebEx is not responding. So I can't do anything. Can you see me? Yes.